Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York in Greenwich Village at the home of celebrated food critic Mimi Sheridan. It's a very special day to be here, an extraordinary day, in fact. You'll find out why next. Mimi Sheridan, it is such a delight to be with you on this very special day, and I am going to paraphrase the first Seder question. Why is this day different from all other days? Well, because it's the day I turn 96, which can only happen once for each year, which is a little bit uh, hard to believe for me to be reaching that age. And um, I guess that's why it's very special for me. You're I can't all... quite believe it, to tell you the truth. You look marvelous. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Most of those 96 years, Mimi, you have spent here, in this house, in this part of town, Greenwich Village. Right, I've been in Greenwich Village since 1945, and I've been in this house since 1965. How did you choose to be in the village? You were born in Brooklyn. Yes, and I couldn't wait to move to what we call the city. Good way to get out, huh? <laughs> the city. Yeah. Um, the. Um, Wonderful novelist, who I think is no longer adequately remembered, Erwin Shaw, was uh, once asked about um, <clears throat> going to Brooklyn College during the uh, Depression. Hmm. And he said it was uh, free, it was um, progressive, and it taught me everything I had to know to get out of Brooklyn. <laughs> And I think Midwood High School, which I loved and which I've done a lot of things for since leaving, taught me to get out of Brooklyn as soon as possible. At Midwood High School, you showed what I think were very early signs of an interest in journalism when some um, players from the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers, showed up at the high school one day. Yes, tell, well, tell us it, about that. It was a special game between two Brooklyn schools, Midwood and I don't remember which, were at Ebbets Field. Well, the high schools were playing at Ebbets Field. Yeah. And Pee Wee Reese and um, Reza, Pee Wee Reese were both there. And I got down on the field and I had a notebook with me, and I did an interview. And then I uh, submitted it to the school newspaper, and I was told that uh, women, girls, can't write about sports. <laughs> yeah, that you can write about, you should write about cooking. So I thought, that's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. I really didn't know. It was writing of some sort. What a rude uh, reception for your work. Yeah. Girls don't write about sports, he I, said. I'm, I'm sure a lot of b boys and girls at that time in that class or in the school seeing these Dodgers were delighted to meet them and maybe get an autograph, but you were interested in doing a story about it. Right. Them. I just grabbed something to scribble on and got myself down on the field. I can still see the picture of Reeser and Reese standing around. You know, they were such stars then, and um, I was a big uh, Dodger fan. Of course. And they used to have things like Woman's Day, at the Evitz Field, where I can't remember what the cost, but it was probably about a quarter for females on really? Women's Day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you get to the city, and at some point there's a, there's a young man in the picture, and what happened with him? Well, after I graduated from Midwood uh, and enrolled at NYU for the first two years, I lived at home and commuted every day. Uh, it was quite normal for um, graduates to, yeah. who are in New York to live at home. And, uh, and a 
pre-war beau, who I had gone out with, came back, and we decided to elope. Elope? Elope. I was 19, and we eloped to Greenwich, Connecticut <laughs> with Bill Sheraton. And um, then, because I didn't want my parents to support me other than keep paying my uh, tuition, uh, I switched to night school. Oh. And it was NYU, so we thought the best place to live was Greenwich Village, because if I went to school four nights a week, I wanted to be a block or two or sure. two to, to walk. So I got a job as a copywriter in an ad agency, and I went to night school. And uh, so since 19, in the for autumn of 45, I lived in Greenwich Village. I had explored the village a great deal in my first two years because I cut a lot of classes to see the village. <laughs> <laughs> and what I learned the most about it was Greenwich Village, and I loved it. And I lived on 9th Street between 5th and University Place in a one-room furnished basement apartment. Mm. I was in for six years. You couldn't find places to live then. It was right after World War II. I, I spent VJ Day in uh, Times Square celebrating the war, oh. the war's arm. Did a sailor kiss you? Or that's not you in that picture? <laughs> no, that's not me. And um, when I got to school, like at a quarter to six in the evening, Radios were on in all the classrooms, and people were in the hall saying, it's over, the war is over. Yeah. So I called my parents to say, I'm going to Times Square, I'll be home late. Well, let's, let's talk about food, which I think is something you know a little bit about. Yes. Uh, and I've heard you talk about how you basically learned food at home. Um, Unknowingly, I was storing what was a sort of family interest from two aspects. My mother was a wonderful cook. She cooked um, a real mixture of what I would call Fanny Farmer and Ashkenazi and sort of social party cooking. She kept recipes torn from the newspapers, from the Brooklyn Eagle, from the World Telegram. She entertained at home a lot. And we talked about the food while we were eating it. I don't like it this way. I prefer it the other way. Uh, my mother, if you said you liked it another way, my mother would say, no, I'm going to make it this way. All <laughs> of us. So that was cooking and entertainment. Also, for a good part of my teens, I did homework in the kitchen, in the dinette part of the kitchen, and I could sort of absorb what my mother was cooking so mm -hmm. that I knew, I always knew how to make a bunch of things. And your dad? Uh, now, that was another aspect of food. My father was what was called a commission merchant in Washington Market, wholesale fruit and produce. And he would come home talking about the fruits and vegetables he handled that day, or what was coming up from here, or what was preferable. He would say, um, you don't buy California orange, uh, Florida oranges. You have to have California oranges, but um, Florida grapefruit. Really? In Indian River, white grapefruit was what he considered I still like that, and in ordinary times, I have, up until two years ago, ordered at least one bunch of white Indian River grapefruit. I remember Indian River grapefruits because uh, my father, he had a fruit and vegetable market in the Bronx, in, in Kingsbridge, on West 231st Street. And he used to uh, buy your father was, you said your father was uh, at the Washington Market? Yes, yes. He was president of several firms during his years there. And um, it was very interesting how the food, how the fruits and vegetables got to the market every night. Yeah. Because they, the truck drivers who drove it up 
would call into my father as they worked up from, say, Georgia, Florida, and he would tell them if there was a um, overstocking of certain of the vegetables or fruits and was bringing a very low price and therefore would say, dump it in Baltimore or dump it in... In other words, you'll get, uh, he's telling them you'll get a better price in Baltimore than you will in New York right no, now. No, not necessarily a better price, but you dump it so you don't make the whole drive oh, I, I see. And, and get a lower price here, spending more gasoline. Well, as I was saying, my father had this store, fruit and vegetable, in the Bronx, and two o'clock in the morning, he would leave our house in the Bronx, take his truck, drive to the Washington Market and buy his, his supplies for that day. I, and, I, and it was during that time that your, I wonder if my father knew your father. That's just Well, amazing. my father would have been much older, of course, than your father. Well, he, I, I mean, my father bought Indian River, uh, you know, grapefruit. He bought Andy Boy broccoli, which I think your father dealt with. Yeah, he was one of the many people who sold Andy Boy. And of course, Andy Boy is still around. Sure. The Rigo brothers who own Andy Boy are still very much around. Well, that's a ju it's just a remarkable possible memory. I, I, thought I'd I thought I'd bring that up. It sort of taught me discernment that, you know, not everything is alike. Some things are better than others. My father thought Apples from the Northeast were much better to, uh, than apples from the Northwest, where he felt uh, they didn't have cold enough nights. Really? He thought, you know, Mac Macintosh, Massachusetts, New York, those were the apples. So this begins to teach you to sort of judge it. It was like a hobby. Well, this one is better than that. And uh, actually, the first field about which I wrote was not fee uh, food. It was um, uh, interior design, furniture. Yeah, for, year, for, for several years, for several different publications. Right, and, but food was the hobby. Yes, you have a wonderful... <laughs> you're, you're writing interior design and decoration. You're uh, for, what, 17 and... Um, couple of other magazines right and yet as you say house food, beautiful yeah house beautiful and and uh, you say food was your hobby and I love this line of your your quote do you remember this I brought back you know from your travels for for this work the interior yeah. design you did a lot of traveling um, I brought back cookbooks in languages I couldn't read that, yeah <laughs> languages I didn't understand in some cases it was really an alphabet couldn't, I couldn't understand, like Russia. Sure. But someone helped in each, in each case uh, where it was something I really wanted to write about. Uh, Swedish, I, very good uh, Bonnier cookbook that I learned many dishes from. Uh, it's um, not too difficult because the vocabulary is somewhat... Uh, um, sort of brief for cooking. I mean, yeah. it's stir, dry, chop, you know, you and what the foods are. And once you know those, you can read the recipes. So after these jobs, or uh, I, it, I'm, I'm trying to catch up, I, you, were, you started writing food, and I think you were writing food, what, for the, for the Village Voice for, for a period, right? Yes, later, after 17. At 17, I started with the furniture and design, but then they also gave me food to do. The ah. food editor left, and my office was adjoining the test kitchen. So they said, well, you do the food also. It's not very much on 17. And then I went, uh, you know, to House Beautiful, and then that was all the design. Craig Claiborne quits, retires as right. the, as the uh, restaurant critic and food writer for the Times, and you apply. Let's 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 go into that <laughs> story. I applied and I was not given an interview, and uh, not not an. You applied and they they wouldn't even see you. They I had one interview, and uh, was rejected. 
And a lot of the editors who were involved have to had told other people that they're looking for a man for the job because Craig had, you know, Craig was a man and he really started criticism in the paper. He originated restaurant reviews. And so they felt that it should be a man who had it. And I reported that to now, you know, the. <laughs> And the they National weren't Organization interested. For women. Yes. They weren't interested because they had just negotiated something else with the town and didn't want to take it. So you weren't you weren't taking this lying down, so to No, speak. I was not taking it lying down. And then in, I don't know what I can't remember that year, but in 1975, I had been by that time working several years uh, for New York Magazine. One of the first articles I did for them. Uh, was called I Tasted Everything in Bloomingdale's Food Department. It was, I believe, 1,196 items. And you really did? Yeah. I really did. I have over there, if you want to see it. They did a big reprint of it in their 50th anniversary wow. issue. Yes, it took I want to 11 see months, and it's 12 pages. I reported on each oh. of the items. <laughs> And uh, so then I became part of the staff at New York Magazine. And while I was there uh, in 1975, my fifth year, I had a call from uh, um, Joan Whitman, who was the editor of the style, food, and so on, asking me to come in for an interview. At the Times? She at was, the Times. She was the editor at the Times? Yes. So now the Times, five or six years later, after not even giving you an interview, is eager to have you on the paper. Did you, did you throw that at their, back in their faces like, hey, what about five years ago? Well, I did ultimately. Um, when I reported complaint to now and so on, I got a note from one of the assistant managing editors at the Times, Peter Mal Malonis saying, your protest, your attitude proves that you are no one to work at the New York Times. Aha. Uh -huh. And so after five years when they were hired, I then wrote to Milonis and said, you know. Guess what, buddy? Guess, yeah, I was no good and here I am. And, but I didn't begin there as the restaurant critic. I began doing food stories. But anyway, I, when I came to the interview with Abe Rosenthal, I said, I don't want the job unless I'm going to be the restaurant critic. And he said, you know, uh, the art critic is doing now. He's not going to be here much longer doing that, and then you will become. So it took almost six months. It was August of 1976 well, that I became the critic. Well, you say you started doing food stories, and uh, I've read where you, you talked about those first few years that the um, focus then was, was on people wanting to cook authentically at home, and you apparently went around to the various cooking class, cooking school. T tell me about I that. I think that I went to 88. I think that's the number. It, it was a big time of cooking classes and learning to cook authentically. It was the beginning of the cuisine art, oh, which uh, sure. Craig credited with having added to the interest. And uh, you had to uh, make your own ice cream. You had to make your own pasta from scratch. You know, it was all authentic, authentic, Chinese, Italian, French, and so on. And I went to all of the schools. The Times had been in the habit of listening to uh, the details on all the cooking classes in the, around Labor Day, but no one had been as visited the schools, so I did. I, yeah. And I, rated, I, think... and I gave some bad reviews, and the problem was in the subsequent years they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> so. Well, I think you said you visited every cooking school in the city. Yeah, for those I think it was 88. 
88 wow. different schools. And then a few years later, the 80s, the, the focus shifts to eating out, and now you're the restaurant critic. Right. And um, what, was that, what was that shift like? What do you, now you're eating out, what, five, six nights a week? Uh, even more than that. There's some years I only ate home five times in the whole year. And that really? would be like Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, my husband's birthday, uh, Passover. I used to do a Seder. Mm. Uh, and um, I was out almost every night and some lunches. And I wore wigs. I had three different yeah. wigs. I was going to ask you about disguises because, you know, a restaurant critic doesn't necessarily want the restaurant owner or manager to know that he or she is there. Oh, I definitely didn't want them to know. And I had three different wigs and I had six pairs of fake eyeglasses. I mean, it had, they had <laughs> plain glass and, and different uh, frames because I didn't wear glasses. Yeah. And um, for a long time it worked. Then the most fashionable places began to know you know, it was sort of they had connections or someone took a picture of me or, you know, but the, re the reservations were always made in someone else's name. Uh, if uh, I w my husband and I went with another couple to a place where I thought I might be known, my guests would arrive first to see how they were treated without me and if they got a good table. And that led to some very funny things. Uh, I once went to the Four Seasons where I knew I would be known because I had done a lot of work, research on the original Four Seasons. For you, you helped design the menu. Yes, I did research on recipes. Uh, Joe Baum, who was the sort of Cecil B. DeMille of restaurateurs, yes. Yes. Um, wanted a lot of background. And, you know, we brought a set of an antique China dinner service. If anyone wanted to have a private party for Chinese type food, they would have the special utensils and that. So I knew I would be known to, so my guests arrived first and I asked them to order an appetizer uh -huh. before my, so when I showed up and was shown to the table, they were just beginning to slice a side of smoked salmon, and they whisked the uh, uh, gyrodon away and That's brought it. out a fresh side of salmon. I see. And in several places where they began to catch on, they would uh, start new cakes and desserts on the dessert wagon or the order. You know, they used, used to be quite common to have dessert wagons pull up to the sure. table. So. I, I, I guess what you're describing is at times your guests would be being served some kind of food, then you'd show up and they'd say, uh-oh, oh, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> we better bring out the fresh yeah, stuff, yeah, the yeah, better we stuff. Know her. <laughs> I, I believe it makes a huge difference. Oh, of course uh, it does. If, you know, sure. There are people who say it doesn't, that if you show up, what can they do at the last minute? They can do so much. I did write an article for, Va uh, yeah, I wrote it or I was interviewed for it, for Vanity Fair on um, uh, what, what happens if they know you and you can do this, you, they can do right. that. And Adi Giovanetti, who had the restaurant Il Nido, oh, yeah. sent me, he called me to say, we can do a lot more, signora. If you, <laughs> he says, if you order an appetizer, we have plenty of time to work with the main course. Mm. And, um, and of course, they could make a huge difference in where they, where they were seated, but they would say, we can even quiet down a noisy party next to you. Wow. We know how to court. I didn't want to ask how they knew how to court them. But um, I mean, there, there are all kinds of things. Sure. I got to ask you, uh, one or two memorable meals whether from that time as a restaurant critic, Memorable whether they were really good or really bad. Oh, that's a tall order. I will say a couple of things I did were very unusual in giving four stars to a Japanese restaurant. That was, you know, Hatsuhana. 
when they opened in New York, and uh, Vienna 79, which was a wonderful restaurant for a long time on 79th Street. And uh, the French and the Italian restaurateurs were furious that I would give four stars to a Japanese restaurant and to an Austro-German restaurant. You know, oh. they, and I don't think the Italians, uh, the French were so happy about the Italians getting three stars or something like that. But well, there are, there are many, many thousands more meals and restaurants in, in, um, in Mimi's career as she traveled around the world uh, searching for food and studying food and uh, once said, food is a very great handle by which to pick up another culture. And next week, you're going to come back here and talk about the cultures you studied through, uh, through their food. Right. And why it's a, a handle. You know how people begin to feel about you when uh, you talk about food they grew up with. All right. Build a certain test. Oh, you know, even if it's a crazy thing like in Denmark, Erlebrod soup, which is a beer and bread soup that's fed to kids in kindergarten. Really? It is disgusting. <laughs> I went to a kindergarten when I was there and tried some, but people who grew up with it, you know, it's like talking about home and mom and dad. Well, hope. Hold the rest of those stories. We're going to see you next week, and we hope to see you next week. Why would you miss it? We'll see you next week.